Have you heard the news? NFPA 70E is changing the way electrical work is being performed across the country. Whether you own or operate a company, are involved in safety and compliance, or work with energized electrical conductors, these changes affect you. Just a few moments of your time now could save your company thousands of dollars in the future. Hi, my name is Vince May. Allow me to take a few moments of your time to explain the important information found in NFPA 70E the consensus standard that OSHA has begun to use to enforce safe electrical work practices. The National Electrical Code is one of the oldest electrical standards and is sponsored by the National Fire Protection Association. During its formation, OSHA found the code to be a very useful document, but not exactly what they needed. As the National Electric Code is written to ensure safe electrical installations, in Article 90.1 of the National Electrical Code, we learn the purpose of this code is the practical safeguarding of persons and property from the hazards arising from the use of electricity. What are the three basic hazards of electricity? Probably the first to come to mind is shock or electrocution. Then there is the arc or fire. And finally, a blast or explosion. Which one of these hazards do you think causes the most deaths in industry. Ninety percent of deaths are by electrocution. Which one of these do you think creates the most injury in industry? Over seventy-five percent of all injuries are from the arc flash and burning clothing. In FPA 70E, the standard for electrical safety in the workplace, details how employees should work on or near electrical equipment. The standard is divided into four parts with Part 1 covering safety-related work practices, which is receiving the greatest attention due to the requirements for arc flash protection and the introduction of live work permit rules. Parts 2 and 3 deal with electrical maintenance requirements or specific and unusual equipment like lasers or battery rooms. And Part 4 is a direct reprint from applicable standards found in the National Electrical Code. NFPA 70E covers electrical installations for most buildings and structures, with notable exceptions for underground mines, airplanes, automobiles, and some electric utility installations. There are several steps in the safety sequence, and each plays a vital role in protection of workers from injury on the job. The first and best method is to eliminate the hazard, but that is difficult, especially for the electrician who is far more exposed than most workers. Next is the use of engineering controls like lockout procedures or the use of fast-acting current limiting fuses. De-energizing and locking out an energy source is the best method for achieving an electrically safe work condition. Barriers and guards provide protection from inadvertent contact with exposed live terminals. Then there is training to educate the worker on how best to avoid the hazard. And finally, the last line of defense is PPE, personal protective equipment. Let's examine the hazard of shock. Using Ohm's Law, we can see that an average person with wet skin will have a little more than one-tenth of an amp of current flow through their body at 120 volts. Even very small amounts of current flow can cause death. A hard-working employee generating a heavy sweat is at great risk for lethal levels of current flow. In industrial environments, most of the exposed surfaces of a building are considered conductive paths. A GFCI is one of the best devices ever invented to prevent death by electrical shock. This next video illustrates just how quickly a simple electrical repair can become a tragedy. I worked with Jerome for years, you know, most of the low voltage stuff, 480 volts, 600 volt max. He never did wear his gloves, especially when he was troubleshooting. He felt that the, the gloves got in his way, kept him from getting a feel for what he was doing. Nah, they're getting away. I was helping them troubleshoot this circuit, and uh, Jerome had to reach deep down into the bucket to uh, test the output on a special relay that we had added to the control circuit. And he had to use both of his hands to do it, so I was holding the meter for it. Well, he got the leads on the terminal block of the relay, but I got nothing on the meter. All right, 
and it happened so fast, just like that. One second I was talking to him, and the next second he was being electrocuted. Well, I turned off the disconnect as quickly as I could, and I done CPR and everything. Somebody, help! He didn't make it. He just didn't make it. Accidents like this one can happen to anyone who works on energized electrical equipment. Even the most competent and qualified electrician can make a fatal mistake. In a fundamental electrical circuit, current flows from the transformer to the main service, then through the circuit breakers and to the load on the ungrounded conductors or hot wires, and then returns to the transformer on the neutral or grounded conductor. Someone who's been shocked has become a part of that path. But even if a person doesn't become part of the path, they are at risk of an electric arc flash. If an ungrounded conductor or hot wire contacts the grounding conductor or grounded surface, we have just created a circuit with a very low resistance path. How much current do you think will flow from the transformer during this faulty condition? The answer I like to use is simply all of it. Whatever the transformer can provide. This is referred to as fault current. The circuit breaker or fuses sense the excess current flow or heat and opens the circuit. But for that brief moment, until the breaker opens, large amounts of current are flowing through the entire system. The result is an electric arc flash. The temperatures can reach 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it does so almost instantly. This intense heat vaporizes metal, creating a bright flash and expelling molten metal hot gases and pressure waves. All of this in the blink of an eye. 